Unexpected podcast with me, your host, Crystal Colley, also known as the most famous woman in the world. So today I want to share with you guys a little bit of Jewish wisdom. And for those of you who don't know, I am technically fully Jewish, even though I'm actually half black and half white, as we say here in America. But my mother is Jewish, which makes me technically fully Jewish. And my dad is black. He is just American. And I picked up a book that really impacted me this last week called The Money Code, Become a Millionaire with the Ancient Jewish Code by H.W. Charles. And I just wanted to share a few things from this book because it really has impacted me this last couple weeks just reading. And actually, this book is extremely short. You could easily read it in an hour or two. It's just a few bucks. It's not expensive at all. It's super thin, and uh, you can pick it up on Amazon. I'm not sponsored. I don't know this guy. I don't even. I didn't even look at actually the date that it was written. Um, but this book was. It goes through just some basic behavioral habits that all of us should adopt in our pursuit of success and our pursuit of becoming wealthy. And the reason why I got this book and how I stumbled upon it was because it dawned on me that if you want to learn about true generational wealth creation, you should learn it from people who are the best in the world at it. And out of all of the groups of people in the world and communities of people, races and ethnicities and however you want to slice them and dice them, out of everyone, Jewish people are exponentially more wealthy as a class of people than any other group on the planet. And here's some crazy statistics for you. Jewish, uh, the Jewish population is less than 1% of the earth's population, yet they make up 25% of the world's billionaires. So this is crazy. Less than 1% of the population, yet they are every one in four billionaires is Jewish. So clearly there's something going on here, right? For me, it's not even that I happen to be Jewish, um, especially because I actually wasn't raised culturally Jewish. I'm ethnically Jewish, but we didn't, um, my side of the family, even though I was raised with my mom, we didn't have any real tradition. Our family didn't practice any kind of like Jewish holidays. We didn't celebrate Hanukkah. We didn't go to synagogue. We were just kind of solidly American. We celebrated Christmas, even though I didn't even know Christmas had anything to do with Jesus or Christianity until I was, I think I was probably 18 or 19 by the time I even really put those two things together. So um, it's not that for me and for all of you listening, we're here to learn about how to get out of poverty, how to get out of debt, how to create wealth, how to be happy and fulfilled. And for, for that, to that aim, there's no better class of people to learn from than Jews and love them, hate them, have your own opinion about it. Look, that is totally irrelevant to what we're going to talk about today. And it's, and whether or not you believe in God is totally irrelevant as well. Wherever your spirituality is, that is for me, even though this book and today's podcast is going to be talking about religion, it's not really religion. That is the point. It's the behaviors that are being exhibited and the habits that we want to look at and where do these come from and why are they so effective and how can we implement these same habits surrounding money and the same mindset surrounding money into our own life so that we can create the same type of generational wealth and stability for ourselves. If you want to learn how to build a house, go to an expert on construction, right? If you want to learn how to build a software program, go to an expert coder. If you want to learn how to lose weight, go to a really great personal trainer, right? So 
let's dive right in guys so this book has seven codes which are found in religious jewish texts mostly the old testament but of course jewish people don't call it the old testament they call it the tanakh so the very first code is about wisdom so the code itself says length of days is in wisdom's right hand in her left hand are riches and honor and decoded this can mean through obtaining wisdom he will obtain wealth and so interestingly the very first most important code surrounding money that the jewish population looks at is learning and not just learning anything but learning wisdom specifically so what is wisdom wisdom is defined as the quality of having experience and being able to discern or judge what is true right or lasting and for me the most important thing the most important word in that sentence is lasting so we want to go after wisdom that is tried and true not just over the last five years not just over the last 10 years or 20 years but over the course of centuries and centuries because human behavior and the basics of life are not ever going to change so even though we think we're in 2023 and we have iphones and we have everything and we have electric cars and we're going to mars and we now have Starlink and all this stuff and soon we're going to be able to teleport teleport ourselves and blah 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 that's all wonderful and great but the basics of how life works has not changed and it will never change and the basics of how your brain works has not changed the basics of how your body works has not changed the basics of economics has not changed and it won't change so for me it is that the most important thing is that jewish people put an emphasis on learning wisdom that has been tried and true so it is culturally expected in many jewish households to seriously study the laws in the torah and the talmud and the talmud is considered to be judaism's holiest book and in many households a page a day of the talmud is studied each day every single day so that they can read the entire talmud within seven years and with contained within that is lots and lots of wisdom not just about money but also about basic human behavior and the best way to go about living a healthy and sustainable life and by the way just as a as an aside i'm not a practicing jew i just i read this book and it made so much sense to me that i'm like please anybody i don't care what religion you are go get this book so you can at least just pick up a few basic tenets of how to manage your money and importantly how to manage your life so that's the number one thing is valuing books and engaging in study not just every once in a while but as you can see what they just said every day and of course you don't have to be reading the talmud every day but you should be reading you can take that to mean you should be reading one page of a book about wisdom every day whether that wisdom is on money whether that is about fitness nutrition personal development that you should be reading constantly and pursuing wisdom constantly because and and this is this was interesting and great for me to see that the number one code surrounding money is not what stock you should invest in or whether you should invest in real estate versus bonds versus index funds versus mutual funds versus REITs that's not that wasn't the first and most important thing the most important thing is to become wise so not just becoming smart and clever and intelligent but to actually grow in wisdom on a daily basis and one of the pieces of wisdom that they talk about is the wisdom to work extremely hard for a certain amount of time when you're young create abundant wealth and then make money work hard for you 
through wise investments that yield a passive income for life. And so culturally, we can see that Jewish people are aiming toward getting passive income as soon as they can. And this is where we get all of the funny cliches about Jewish people saving money and how they don't want to spend money. And, you know, this is why. It's because they're understanding that every dollar that they spend is a dollar that's not going to be able to work for them and a dollar that is not going to bring them passive income later on in life. So this, I think, is culturally one of the biggest lessons that we can all learn, which is you should be working hard for a certain amount of time, not for the rest of your life forever. The idea is to be able to work while you're physically able and then save as much money as you possibly can and invest it wisely so that you can have passive income and therefore enough time to be able to pursue higher things. Life is not all about just working and especially it's not about working in a job or career that you don't like and you're only doing it just for the money. So uh, Jewish people culturally understand that if you don't have enough time, you won't have enough time to create new inventions. You won't have enough time to develop your full potential in this life. You won't have enough time to study. You won't have enough time for family. You won't have enough time to spend with your children or your grandchildren. So I think that in America, we are so, so oriented toward working and that work in and of itself is our measuring stick and our merit. But this is the year I think we all are waking up even more and more. We just went through the pandemic. We're starting to see that life isn't all about money, that we want to create passive incomes for ourselves as soon as possible so that we can get out of the rat, rat race and we don't have to have a side hustle and we don't have to listen to hours of YouTube videos talking about how to get the next side hustle or how to open up another Etsy store, an Amazon shop or whatever else it's doing. The idea is to Work as hard as you can, save as much as you can, only to make money work for you. Here's another interesting quote. The Talmud actually mentions that a poor person is considered dead. And that's because Jews know that anyone who can't support himself or help others is hampered in what he can accomplish. It even says, poverty in one's home is worse than 50 plagues. And this is in stark contrast to Christianity, which some view poverty as virtuous or even desirable. On the contrary, Jews have always viewed poverty as negative. And I think this is another point that we can learn, which is Jews believe that poverty is pointless suffering. We can take that same mentality and learn to undo the misconceptions we have surrounding money, surrounding poverty, and allow it to uplift us into the next level, to understand that wealth is not a bad thing, being rich is not a bad thing, working and striving for passive income is not a bad thing, working to be able to have passive income is a reality that all of us can obtain, especially us here in America, we're not in a third world country. We're extremely blessed to be able to have near endless opportunities. And so our biggest challenge here is not lack of opportunity. It's we need to just change our mindset surrounding wealth and surrounding the fact that we do not want to be impoverished and that it doesn't help anyone for you to be poor. That does not help you. It doesn't help your family. It doesn't help your community. It doesn't help the earth. And it's not a good thing. It's not where you want to be. So moving on to code number three. And this one is regarding work. 
So this is about the question of what you should do to become rich. And that is discussed in the Talmud. And it says, let him engage much in business and deal honestly. Another quote is, the diligent will rule while the lazy will be put to forced labor. And here it's pointed out that most Jews work for themselves and hire employees instead of being employees themselves. But on the other hand, most non-Jews don't trouble themselves with creating a company, an invention, or investing and are employees. And I believe this is because culturally Jews understand that you can only trade so much of your time for money. You only have so many hours in a day. So you have an automatic ceiling or cap on that as far as trading your time for money. If you go from being an employee to being an owner, you have, at least you have a shot at wealth creation. Interestingly, Jews also believe that people are creators and not consumers. And I think that is a huge lesson that we can all take to heart right now, which is to stop consuming and spending so much and instead focus on inventing, focus on creating, focus on being the one that makes the product instead of being the one that buys it. Importantly, the code also talks about happiness and what true happiness is. And it talks about the fact that happiness does not result from pleasure, but rather from reaching one's goals. And that happiness can be defined as the function of the effort we put forth toward the realization of your goals. So understanding that happiness is not just a fleeting feeling, but our idea and our goal is to create a life of fulfillment which comes from being a creator and not con a consumer and from creating passive income for ourselves so that we can have a fulfilling life in our, at, in our older age, but also as soon as we possibly can. The code also talks about how your profession, what you choose to do, should not only just be enjoyable, but it should also be profitable. So there's two components to what you should be doing with your time. You shouldn't purely pursue only your passions, but you shouldn't purely only pursue things that make money either. You should strive to find a healthy balance between something you can do that is enjoyable, but is also income producing and can be very profitable. Moving on to code number four, we start talking about investing. So the code says, bind up the money in thy hand. And decoded from the Talmud, it says, one's money should be always ready to hand. One should always divide his wealth into three parts, investing, a third in land, a third in merchandise, and keeping a third ready to hand. So we can see here that from thousands of years ago, they were already talking about diversification. And this is extremely, extremely important in no matter what you're doing, that you never want to have your eggs in one basket. So here it talks about having your wealth divided into three parts. Because of course, during ancient times, there was no such thing as a New York Stock Exchange, and there was no such thing as Robin Hood, and there was no such thing as crypto. So in ancient times, there were only so many ways that you could diversify your wealth. But importantly, they were talking about it and they were ingraining it into their families that you don't want to have all of your wealth in cash. You don't want to have all of your wealth only in a savings account. You don't want to have all of your wealth only in a house. You want to be able to split it up. And in this case, they're talking about having basically a third in business inventory, a third in real estate, and a third in cash. And that's what they mean by ready to hand. But today we can look at that and say, okay, we should always make sure that our wealth is not just all tied up in your primary residence, for example, or all of your cash just sitting in a savings account, not making you any money. You should have it, you should have it well diversified into at least seven to eight different assets. And quickly, I just want to point out that investing and earning is actually quite boring. It is a set it and forget it type of activity. 
The best way to grow wealth is slowly over time. The best way to become a multimillionaire is not to play the hottest stocks and go on Wall Street bets and buy this individual stock and then get excited about this other stock and then buy that and then sell this and then do that and then do this and then get into crypto and then buy high and then sell low and then lose money and this. That is gambling. That's not investing your wealth for the long term. You will become wealthy faster by going slower. And there's wisdom in this book that talks about that as well, which is you will lose your money faster if you start doing things like gambling. So if you want a very easy way to invest and start earning, you could do something as simple as simply just investing in the S&P 500 and just setting it and forgetting it and not even looking at it or worrying about it. It's not exciting. It's not going to be something that you're getting dopamine hits from. It's just going to be a set it and forget it type of thing. And that is going to build your wealth much faster than trying to do harebrained schemes. Interestingly, Lisa Keister's study also found that Jews invest early in life in high-risk, high-return financial assets, and then as time goes on, they lower that risk and lower the returns but keep investing. And they actually build wealth more quickly while putting less emphasis on a primary home ownership. And that is in sharp contrast to how most non-Jews invest. She says that about one third of Jews followed this path compared to only 7% of mainline Protestants, only 4% of Catholics, and 0% of conservative Protestants. One of the most shocking and interesting points in this book and in this chapter is that conservative Jews are protected from serving creditors because one of the laws is to not borrow money with interest. So what that means is Conservative Jews do not have credit card debt. They don't purchase homes on a home loan. They don't purchase cars through finance. When they buy something, they make sure that they have enough money to outright buy it. So, which is in sharp contrast to how most of us live. Most of us live using credit cards, buying our car on a car loan, and buying our home on a home loan. So this, this alone, this law alone, you can easily see how the impact of such a law would affect a people over generations and generations and generations. Just imagine if your parents never had a single dime of debt. And then imagine if their parents never had a single dime of debt. And then imagine if their parents never had a single dime of, of debt. And imagine if all of those people had invested wisely in safe assets like land and real estate and trusts and all of that was passed down, you can easily start to see how these basic common sense practices can easily build up generational wealth. These are fundamental wealth accumulation principles which are not taught to us, which are not taught in American schools and are not a part of our culture. And I think if we just implemented a few of these laws, we could not just only turn around as individuals and have wildly better lives, but we could turn around as a nation. Moving on to code number five, it talks about cause and effect. And essentially, this law talks about karma by another name. So... This law is also known as the Iron Law of Human Destiny. It's also known as the Law of Action and Reaction or the Law of Cause and Effect. So in essence, this law talks about what goes around comes around. It talks about being an honest person and doing and dealing in business honestly. It also talks about how in order to become wealthy, you need to avoid drunkenness and gluttony. And even though these things are, you know, I'm sure some of you listening are like, uh, you know, this is just going on prattling about being religious, 
But really, these are just common sense practices that you don't have to be religious or believe in God to realize that if you're getting drunk all the time, not only are you wasting your money on alcohol, but you're probably wasting time because you're having a hangover as well. You're probably also ruining your reputation as a responsible person because people around you are seeing you being drunk and aren't going to want to trust you with their money, their time, or investments. And to wrap it up, the last couple laws talk about something that I'm sure you all have heard about before, but it does talk about tithing. But this goes back to the law of cause and effect. And, and Jews believe that giving to charity is essential to accumulating wealth, so much so that they say that even a poor man should give to charity in order to get out of his poverty. So you can see clearly that they really do believe in the law of cause and effect on a visceral level and not just intellectually. They put into practice their belief in the law of cause and effect. They believe in not committing fraud in being honest, which just think about it. That's common sense. If you have a business and you start to accumulate the reputation of being an honest business that deals fairly with its customers, aren't you going to attract more and more and more customers? Just think of someone who for their entire life is known for giving to charity, helping people, being honest, being responsible, not being drunk or addicted to drugs, being a hard worker, investing wisely, caring about their family, wouldn't that person end up with a great life at the end? It would seem completely counterintuitive that if someone who made sure to give 10% of all of their earnings to people in need, it would make no sense that that person would end up with a bad life. That person would end up with a radically different life than someone who was greedy, dishonest, drunk all the time, doesn't care about their family. So you can see that these laws aren't just for religious people. These are just things that we can remember and implement into our own lives on a daily basis. They're just common sense things that we usually don't hear about outside of a religious context, which is sad because clearly these things affect how much money you make how much money you keep, and how much money you're going to be able to give to your children and your grandchildren. And with that, I want to wrap up this episode with something on charity that Anne Frank wrote, which was, no one has ever become poor by giving. Okay, guys, I really hope that you gained some wisdom from this talk on Jewish wisdom and I really hope that no matter what religion you are, whether or not you believe in God, whether or not you're spiritual at all, that you can just take some of these common sense practices and implement them into your own life so that you too can become a millionaire and become fulfilled and happy and create generational wealth for your family. And as always, remember, each one teach one. The information provided in this podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only and should not be construed as financial advice, investment advice, or medical advice. The host is not a financial advisor nor a medical doctor or licensed therapist. Any financial or medical decisions made based on the information in this podcast are made at the listener's own risk. It is recommended that listeners consult with licensed professionals such as CPAs, financial advisors, and licensed physicians before making any investment or medical decisions. The host and creators of this podcast accept no responsibility or liability for any loss or damages incurred as a result of the information provided in this podcast.